Some of you may have heard of John Wimber, who was the founding fa uh, father, founding pastor of the Vineyard Movement uh, of Churches. Uh, and uh, in his early days, he also worked as a church growth consultant, leading seminars and teaching sessions. Uh, and the church growth movement is about analysing why some churches grow and others don't, and trying to work out what the patterns are and to encourage uh, ways in which other churches can follow that. He was doing a, a, a training session, uh, and uh, at one of these sessions there was a, a dyed-in-the-wool Southern Baptist pastor who rather liked the sound of his own voice. Um, sometimes preachers can be like that, can't they? No comment. Anyway, John was doing his presentation, you know, all the statistics on the wall and all the rest of it, and this guy kept coming in and saying, yes, but bless God, I want to know how to grow my church. And John would make some response and then get back to the job in hand, yes, but bless God, I want to know how to grow my church. And uh, eventually, John stopped and looked him in the eye and said, how many more like you do you want? <laughs> and of course the guy was cut to the heart and he said, I don't want them to be like me, I want them to be like Jesus. And John said, well, that's a good place to start. I was so pleased to hear Joel's sermon a couple of weeks ago talking about how compassion motivated Jesus and how it should be our starting point for outreach. Uh, and it's great that the elders have identified outreach and discipleship as one of the main areas of focus uh, going forward. I have a slight problem. When people hear the word outreach, they hear many different things. Quite a lot of people hear ingrab. Do you know what I mean? Um, so actually what they're hearing is bums on seats on Sunday. And of course, that we hope and pray may be the end product, but it's not what outreach is really all about. Uh, then there are perhaps, according to the church growth an analysis, there are perhaps 10% of the church people who are gifted in evangelism. That's their analy analysis. Uh, and the 10% get really, really excited. At last, the church is going to be doing something that it's really here for. Let's get on with it and get a few scalps for Jesus. Uh, the trouble is, I suspect there are many who are not necessarily gifted evangelistic types who actually feel an enormous sense of guilt and pressure and subconsciously say, well, that lets me out then for a start. It's a pity, uh, because we may not all be evangelistically gifted, uh, but we're all called to be witnesses. We're all called to share uh, what we know of Jesus, and we all have a part to play. Now, back to the church growth movement. Uh, they identified what used to be called 3P evangelism. Uh, and the three Ps work at different levels, uh, and they uh, work together, uh, and of course it's only an analysis, so it's not necessarily the whole story, but it's actually quite helpful. <clears throat> Each of these has one main area of focus, and they form a progression for the good news of Jesus. So the first P is presence, and actually this is vitally important because too often we jump straight into the last P, which is persuasion. It's about making people, encouraging them to make a decision for Jesus uh, and to become uh, personal followers of him. But the presence bit is vitally important too. It's about the church and its influence on and in the community. It's about making friends for Jesus and with Jesus. Making friends because Jesus lives in you, so he's with you when you do that. When I used to do school assemblies, sometimes you'd go into a primary school and you'd have reception uh, right the way up to year six. 
uh, and it's almost impossible to do something that engages all of them all the time. Uh, and you may think this was a bit of a cop-out, but my purpose was to leave a positive impression for Jesus and the church. Anything else was a bonus. If they actually listened to the story, if they joined in a prayer or anything like that, that was a bonus. But what I was aiming to do was to leave a positive impression, the presence, because you can build on that. If you go in and you, um, forgive me, ponce about like a posh vicar, they just laugh at you, and that doesn't leave a positive impression for the church. Um, when the church was a vaccination hub, that's about presence in the community. And some of you may have felt, well, that's not really doing the stuff. Actually, it's the beginning of making relationships. Do you, do you see where we, we get to on this? Um, then there's the, the proclamation, the second P. This is about telling the gospel. And this is a lot of what we do on a Sunday morning. It's proclaiming the truths of the Bible and informing people of what Jesus means in our lives. Uh, and uh, this takes things a little bit further. And whereas, for example, something like a toddler group, Pebbles, uh, is, is mostly about presence evangelism, uh, something like Messy Church moves on a little bit more towards proclamation evangelism because within what they do, there's a message. And it doesn't always come home, and for many people, it's about presence and being part of the community. Are you seeing how this works together? Uh, uh, and then, of course, there's the third P, which is persuasion. And this is where we invite people to respond to Jesus uh, and giving people a genuine opportunity to respond. Uh, and uh, in the old days, this was about gospel services and events where they had uh, what you call in the trade an altar call. You know, people come forward and uh, X number of people were counseled, uh, that you used to say. And what they meant was they had a conversation about faith and maybe prayed a prayer about giving their lives to the Lord Jesus. I'm not sure that that works quite so well these days. Um, and I suspect that though there are occasions when we can do events like that and, and they are useful, that an awful lot of it is about personal conversation. Uh, and it's about maybe the conversation and the prayer prayed uh, individually with someone after a church service. Um, interestingly, the Vineyard Movement uh, went on to identify a fourth P, Presence, proclamation, persuasion. And they talked about power evangelism. Uh, interestingly, Joel's going to talk about when the church needs a miracle next Sunday. Um, power evangelism is where miracle signs and wonders cut right through and bring people straight to the point where, like on the day of Pentecost, they called out and said, brothers, what shall we do? What must we do to be saved? Anyway, uh, let's see Jesus in action as we hear Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, read to us. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding round him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, 
don't be afraid. From now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. Now in uh, the New International Version, that, uh, that uh, reading is headed, The Calling of the First Disciples. But interestingly, uh, and Luke was very careful about his chronology, we read in the previous chapter that Simon Peter already knew Jesus. It wasn't suddenly on the seashore, put your boat out, off we go, you're going to become fishers of men. He already knew Jesus. Or at the very least, Jesus was a family friend. In chapter 4, verse 38, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. That's Simon Peter, of course. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she got up at once and began to wait on them. We would presume, as we're told they were in Simon Peter's home, that he would have been among the they who asked Jesus to help his mother-in-law. Clearly, he was the head of the household, uh, and it looks as though father-in-law was no longer around as mother-in-law was living with them. Peter was already aware that Jesus was someone special and that he had power to do extraordinary things. And yet, and yet, he wasn't yet following him as a disciple. Do do you see how the the three P thing, it builds up? Anyway, Peter already knew Jesus. Now, one of the things that um, I wrestled with as a pastor was how far do you involve people in church life who are not yet quite there with Jesus? And uh, the solution that we ended up with in the last church was that anyone who was willing could help in the ministries of the church, but only those who were church members could actually be leaders of the groups and ministries. Other churches work it in all sorts of different ways. But if you think about it, we're all on that spiritual journey, and we're all in different places on that spiritual journey. And it's quite important that the church has what they call fluid edges, so that they're willing to embrace people who are not quite there yet but to embrace them with compassion as they grow into their destiny in Christ Jesus. Because the bottom line is that if we wait for them all to be perfect and to get their doctrine and their relationships all sorted out, you'll be waiting a long time. And there was an influential report some years back that suggested, and again, this is not the whole story, but that actually people need to feel that they belong to the community before they're ready to commit to faith. They've discovered in Brazil and other places where they've had massive growth in the church that it's easy enough to make converts, but often they bring along all the other stuff that they have with them, spiritualism and all sorts of other beliefs, and it's not so easy to make disciples. It's the community that makes disciples. It may be the evangelistic event that makes a convert, but how long do they last? Are they like those where the seed is thrown among the rocks and and it has no root and it withers and it dies? So people often need to feel that they belong to the community of the church, that this is my church, this is our church, even if they're not actually a church member, even if they don't come to church meetings, even if they don't sign up to all the things that we want them to and hope and pray that they will eventually. Um, They need to do that before they're ready to come to faith, and once they're part of the community, the process of learning to behave like a Christian then continues. Uh, Unfortunately, there's a downside to this. If you have fluid edges in the church, you also have ragged edges. Again, John Wimber, bless him, used to say, it's always messy in the nursery. 
you're always cleaning people up at one end or the other. And that's the church, isn't it? You know, and, and, and when you're a pastor, you're often dealing with mess. You're trying to help people sort stuff out. Uh, and it's not always easy. Uh, and we all need to wear that badge which says, please be patient, God hasn't finished working on me yet. But notice, as we move on in the story, that Jesus involves Simon Peter. He involves him in his mission. Admittedly, initially, it's just so he can use his boat as a pulpit. Speaking on the water is, um, you, the, you know, the, the, the words can echo quite nicely uh, as you speak into that situation. Jesus involves Simon Peter because there's this family connection and there's already a, a friendship. And he asks to lose the boat as a pulpit. You notice Jesus doesn't presume. He doesn't say, give it to me then. I'm doing this. He actually asks. He saw at the water's edge two boats, left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. There's a word here about letting Jesus into your work. Uh, when I first uh, became a proper Christian, I was a missionary kid and all the rest of it, confirmed when I was 15, brought up round church, sang in the choir and, and all the rest of it. And if you'd uh, challenged me and said I wasn't a Christian, I'd probably punched you on the nose, which probably tells you a little bit about where I was actually at. But when I became a Christian through a Baptist church, uh, I wanted, I was a, a music teacher, and I wanted to do something that was a bit more Christian with my life. Do you know that feeling? And so I started applying for all sorts of jobs with charities that had a vaguely Christian this, that, or the other. And most of them I didn't even get an interview, and quite rightly. Uh, and eventually, something made me realize that Jesus was a teacher. You know, it's slow on the uptake. And that therefore I needed to let him in to what I was doing. It was a revelation. Because what I spent most of my time doing was teaching thick kids who wanted to be a pop star overnight how to play the guitar. Uh, and uh, it's a bit like being messy in the nursery a lot of time with that. Anyway, we won't go there. Um, but it was that moment when I realized I need to let Jesus in and let him take the lead. And maybe there's a word there to someone this morning who hasn't realized that work is a place, an arena, where you need to invite Jesus in, even if it's not doing something specifically Christian, something mundane like fishing. Now, to us, that's got all sorts of loaded stuff because we know how the story goes on. But at the time, fishing was just something that people did for a living. And of course, afterwards, after he's involved Simon Peter and he's done the practical stuff, you know, working the sound system at the back while he's doing the movable pulpit out into the, out into the, the water so that Jesus can use it uh, to speak. But afterwards, Jesus blesses the fishermen with a mega catch. And it's then that the truth finally dawns on Simon. He makes the connection because this was something that he knew about. Do you see how it's beginning to work? But he has to be willing to let Jesus into the fishing business and at his word put out into deep water even though it didn't make sense. Jesus often becomes more real when we let him into life situations where we're at the end of our tether or where we've tried and failed in our own strength. And there's a word here about trying again after failure. Um, sometimes I've had the privilege of talking to Christian leaders, and the ones who are dangerous are the ones who have never failed. Because a leader who's never yet failed hasn't learned the grace 
of how to work with people in a way that brings the best out of them. And they ride them roughshod, and I've watched people do it. But when you've learnt to fail and to get up again and let God lead you forward, then you become someone who's much more useful in his service. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Jesus, I know about fishing and you don't. Why should I bother? It's time for a break. But then he says, and I I almost hear a deep sigh going on here, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And in church life it can be like that. Again, pastoring for around 40 years in various different churches and situations, you fairly soon come up, you know, you're, you're the new puppy bouncing around and thinking things are going to change overnight. You've got this new plan and you've got the old curmudgeon in the back seat who said, we tried that in 1978. Didn't work then, won't work now. But actually, there's a season in God's timing. And just because you've tried and failed... It doesn't mean that God is not going to work through it now. Uh, Sometimes we, we, we were praying for people who were sick and we had a whole line of people and we prayed with them and God was doing some quite extraordinary things. Not always miracle, but healing and power and blessing. And you come along the line and suddenly reach a point where you sensed that the Spirit was no longer powerfully active. Now, whether that's because we'd had enough and it was time to go home, whether it's because there are seasons in the work of God's Spirit. Now, we still pray with people, and God would still bless, but we wouldn't see anything powerful happen. And you need to learn to tune in to the wind of the Spirit. Go down to the seashore, and you can see how the trees are bent over by the prevailing wind. If it's on a calm day, you can't see or hear the wind, but you can see the evidence of how the wind works. And we need to learn to see the evidence of how the wind works, and learn to let Jesus lead and follow where he is leading. And Simon Peter fell at Jesus' feet. Uh, That was the moment when he realized who he really was. Uh, It's that moment when we realize for the first time, or perhaps in a fresh way, that Jesus is not just some airy-fairy Bible days person that we talk stories about. Jesus is not just someone whom we worship in church and sing songs about, but he is God incarnate. He's the saviour of the world. He's heaven touching earth. And suddenly at that moment, you realise. That moment in another context where Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Or Thomas, bless him, when he wasn't there when the other disciples met. And he says, my Lord and my God. When Simon Peter saw this, the miraculous catch. He fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. It's the recognition that Jesus was not just a friend, but he was a higher power. It's a recognition that Peter was a sinner and a plea for mercy, and an appeal for help. Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Uh, Miracles produce fear as well as faith. That was Simon Peter's first response. Uh, And we often think that miracles are the answer. More miracles, power evangelism. Uh, And I suspect that the answer is yes, And no. Because 
sometimes miracles are the answer, but what I've observed is that miracles tend to happen when the gospel is breaking new ground. They don't tend to happen so much among the faithful who are going to glory anyway. I know that sounds a bit harsh, but if you know where you're going and you know your destiny is secure in Christ Jesus, then a miracle is lovely, but you don't need it in quite the same way. So in church life, you can pray earnestly for one of the saints who is suffering grievously. And of course God comes, and of course he blesses, but in the end they die anyway. And then you get some Johnny-come-lately who turns up, who frankly doesn't deserve it, probably looking a bit rough, maybe dressed like a biker, smelling of weed or alcohol or whatever, and God goes and does a miracle. You know, that's so often the way it happens. And there's something in us that feels, well, it's not fair, but it's because it's the gospel breaking new ground. Signs and wonders. Simon Peter didn't really make the connection when his mother-in-law was healed. He was probably just relieved that they were going to get a meal at the end of the day. But fishing he knew, and he knew that today the fish weren't rising. Therefore there wasn't much point in going out, even if Jesus said so, but because you say so. Maybe there was something going on, maybe, maybe. And Jesus blesses with a miracle, and the penny of faith drops for Simon. Luke, interestingly, doesn't have um, the follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He just has a statement by Jesus. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. I know it says roughly the same thing, but it's the moment when Simon Peter and the others, and Luke carefully includes James and John, Zebedee, Simon's fishing partners, they pull up their boats and they leave their livelihood and they follow Jesus. Three questions to end up with. Where are you? What have you seen of Jesus? And what's your response going to be? First of all, where are you? Where are you on your journey of faith? Are you someone who's belonging, but you've never quite made that connection with Jesus personally? You're here this morning, so you're definitely somewhere on the journey. Belonging, being part of the community, but not quite there. Are you believing? Someone who believes in Jesus as Saviour and Lord, and who knows that they're going to glory, but you haven't really quite found your role of service as a Christian. Are you behaving? We all need to progress in our spiritual life and become more like Jesus, holier, not holier than thou in some sort of competitive way. I fasted for 40 days, I fasted for 41, uh, you know, and the sort of the, the competition that used to go on in some youth groups and what have you. It's not competitive, it's about genuinely growing up into the likeness of Christ. Uh, and maybe in order to do that, there's something that you need to let go of today in order to make room for more of Jesus in your life. More room for love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where are you? What have you seen of Jesus? Is he just like a, a, a familiar face, a family friend? Is he someone who you serve, but he's a bit like the boss who is a bit distant? Don't get too close. Or is he someone that you know face to face who's involved in your life because you've invited him in? Now, please don't beat yourself up if your life is not full of spectacular spiritual mountaintops and a miracle a minute experiences. You're on the journey, and that's what matters. But as the Irish comedian used to say, there's more. Don't stop. Don't sit down. Keep moving because we're going to glory. Where are you? What have you seen of Jesus? 
And what will your response to him be? Jesus wants to be with you in your boat, whether that's your workplace, your home, whether it's your talents and gifts and the way you use them, whether it's sport and leisure. If the penny of faith has dropped for you this morning, please make sure you talk to someone and ask them to pray with you before you leave here this morning. Or is God calling you to step out into some new deep water of service in the church, at work, or in some other arena of your life? It was while Peter and the others were serving, out fishing, that Jesus did the miracle. He didn't do it into thin air, as it were, but they had to put out into deep water and ask him along. Or is God marking you out for some particular life calling? Sometimes in the middle of your life of faithful service, the call comes to leave your nets, your livelihood. And this event was the call vision. The Old Testament prophets nearly always had a call vision, something, a spectacular intervention from God which set them on their path. And this was the call vision of Peter, James, and John. Their lives would never be the same again. But if God's speaking to you about that, don't just jump. Don't do it on a whim. Expect God to confirm it through others and perhaps through a miracle. Because when Jesus has given you a month's supply of fish in one haul, you're inclined to trust him to provide for all the rest of it too. And in the deep waters to which he's calling you, you're going to need that assurance of faith. But maybe, just maybe, this morning, there's a conviction of a calling from the risen Jesus that has settled in your heart, and you're going to have to say yes, and it will change your life forever. Let's pray. Lord, confirm in my heart, confirm in our hearts, the call of your Spirit today. And give us faith to step out into deeper waters with you as our guide. And where we need the encouragement of your miraculous provision, grant that too, we pray, by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.